Hello, I'm with Eric Dreitzer of Counterpunch Radio, Counterpunch Magazine, and uh, other things. You're an independent political analyst, which is one of those titles that means a lot of things. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, generally, it means... I don't have a think tank and I'm not an academic, but I do research. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the general scope of it. Um, Counterpunch, you know, Counterpunch is a magazine that I have had an on again, off again relationship with the entire time on the left, going all the way back to when Alex Coburn was alive. I have been on record as saying some pretty negative things about like Alex Coburn and some of the stuff he allowed at Counterpunch in the late aughts. Um, I've also wanted to give you guys credit for really moving away from a lot of that over the past 10 years and people barely noticing. <laughs> and uh, what I mean is like publishing things like Israel Shamir and stuff like that. Um and I find I, I say that because I've been increasingly over the last two or three years impressed by the fact that the editorial line over at Counterpunch has been pretty diverse and pretty fair and factual about the situation first in Syria and then in Russia. And as a, a person who's observed the Syrian situation and been incredibly frustrated uh, with both the Western allied narrative and, frankly, a lot of the anti-imperial narrative on it. Um, I thought Counterpunch's coverage was actually pretty good starting about 2014, 2015. Um, and on the Ukraine-Russia war, I thought you've been incredibly fair without dipping into NATO or Putin apologia, um, which has been kind of hard to do. <laughs> Um, I have come to the conclusion that it's a trying time to be an anti-imperialist when everything is a kind of dirty imperial proxy war, and it's very hard to put your finger on exactly who is acting what uh, and what capacity where. Um, so... As a person who has been following the situation in Russia now, I mean, for a fairly long time, um, what do you think has led so many people to be unable to um, have a kind of factually nuanced position on this over a long haul? And I say this as a person who was wrong, because I, 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 for example, thought uh, Zelensky would cave earlier, or, you know, at all, uh, about about two months into the war after it was clear that it, that it looked like NATO was willing to allow it to become Afghanistan to on the borders of Europe. But, you know, I, I like I said, you, one should not play the prediction game, probably. But uh, what do you... What do you see as, as like a lot of, why do you think so much of the left has been unable to like come to a coherent position on this? Well, if we're talking specifically about the current situation in Ukraine, um, I think it's very clear that <clears throat> the nature of the conflict itself has thrust everybody into awkward positions politically. Um, for many of us, I think it's probably worthwhile to take a step back and say that for many of us, and I speak for myself, but I obviously am speaking for a lot of people probably of my generation, uh, especially those who sort of came of age around 9-11 and the uh, Iraq war, the second Iraq war, Bush, W. Bush's Iraq war. Um, for those of us who came of age in our politics at that time, I mean, the United States was imperialism. Imperialism was the United States. Imperial wars around the world were U.S. wars. These were one in the same. And we understood global imperialism as being a, a system that was headed by the United States and that states basically had to fall in line with that and so forth. So we had a fairly cohesive, fairly simple, and yet fairly uh, grounded analysis of the situation globally. And that was that if you are an anti-imperialist, you are also able to be simultaneously anti-war, 
and anti-imperialist. Why? Because every imperial war was a U.S. war. We This was a basic understanding for a lot of people, um, especially through the 2000s, the war on terror leading up through, you know, into the current period. And part of the reason why it's been difficult for a lot of people is in recognizing the nature of the current conflict as one that is not merely a U.S. war. It is one that is much more complicated, one that has many different motivations, many different facets to it, but one that needs to be understood, and I think this is where some of the difficulty lies, is in understanding Russia's call it sub-imperial ambitions, both within its regions and in terms of reconstituting its quote-unquote sphere of influence, right? And so what we now see is that we have a kind of imperialist war, a neo-colonial war that doesn't fit neatly into this sort of uh, uh, cookie cutter worldview wherein all imperialism is U.S. imperialism. And so now we find ourselves having to uh, sort of come to it, come to a decision about how do we understand the nature of this war and how do we situate ourselves as being truly anti-imperialist? Because how can you really claim anti-imperialism and simultaneously cheerlead an imperialist conflict of this kind? And so again, we, we there's this sort of awkward tension. And you see some uh, on the left who then find themselves having to kind of twist themselves into pretzels to justify support for uh, NATO arms flowing into Ukraine. Simultaneously, other self-professed leftists have to twist themselves into pretzels to find ways to excuse what are obvious war crimes, crimes against humanity, and so forth. And so I guess to answer your question, how did we get to this point? We got to this point because we were never able to evolve a more nuanced politics on these issues. Yeah, I, I was reading uh, Carl Bajer, um recently, and he was pointing out that while many in the global south uh, have sympathies with Russia, almost everybody thinks Russia started the war. Um, and it divides a lot of a lot of international communities. For example, uh, in Palestine, it's a highly divisive area. Era, um, era discussion, and frankly, it's one that's weirdly classed. Um, uh, so when I've talked to Palestinian activists, a lot of the activists seem to think that the situation with Ukraine has put Palestine in, even, in an even worse uh, situation in, in international law, but there are elements of, say, um, say Hamas, uh, and it's, and it's, you know, uh, it's hard to even say working class at this point because it's been shut out of labor, highly lumpenized base um, because of Israeli policy, uh, you know, just likes to stick in the eye of the U.S. and the West. Um, and yet it's hard to square that with with everything going on and how Israel, for example, has been able to reposition itself as a kind of broker Um between the West and Russia. Um, and that's been that's been fascinating to watch. You know, I spent a lot of I spent until 2009 and uh, 18 to I was mostly outside of the United States. So um, I have connections in a lot of countries and there's a lot of general sympathy for Ukraine. There's not a lot of general sympathy towards NATO outside of Europe um, from what for, anecdotally. Um, and people seem pretty, a lot of people outside of the West have pretty complicated views on, on Putin. Um, one of the things I find interesting about this though is I have found that Putin's been somewhat honest about what's going on and and a lot of leftists have had to selectively ignore or I mean in in the case of some of the most marginal you've seen people try to pick up and like leftify Alexander Dugin as an anti-fascist uh which as I'm sure you know is a laughable position <laughs> like um I mean we were talking about a man who in 2012 formerly endorsed endorse golden dawn and cast a pound um 
as an anti-imperialist movement and explicitly called for in European countries um, the encouragement of national Bolshevism, um, which is at minimum fascist adjacent. Uh, and even and sometimes had had uh, had soft ties to the right in Ukraine, depending on the situation. Um, so I find all this kind of, of fascinating. Um, I also find conversely and have been very frustrated with the, like uh, what to do with liberal apologia towards NATO um, the, uh, I just remember, you know, Randy Weingarten, the head of the American Federation of Teachers being in Ukraine for reasons that I just don't even begin to understand. Um, uh, the, the political narratives around this, I mean, I, I would like to remind people that the Democrats were, were calling, you know, you, the, the Western Ukrainian government klepto, kleptocratic not that long ago due to uh, Trump um, engagement with them. I, I, you know, part of the whole impeachment process in, tw in 2019 was tied to this. And our memory here has been quite short. Um, but I also have, have stated plainly I can't, like, I can't, for example, oppose Ukrainians wanting about anything they need to do to get an occupying force out of their country, particularly when the the prior norm um, and the ambiguity over uh, the Russian sympathetic breakaway regions um, are independent republics, depending on your political perspective meant that there was no way that Ukraine could join NATO um, anytime in the, well, as long as that was going on. Yeah. I, I go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I'm done. That's a long, <laughs> that's a little model. I'm not sure I actually had a question. In there. Yeah. Well, that's what I was, that's what I was trying to glean was what was there a question there? I mean, yeah, I think that, um, I think that it's, to me, at this point, I, I just it's hard for me to understand how people can call themselves leftists and then at the same time try to simply ignore the very basic principle of the solidarity with people defending themselves. I mean, this is a this is a country that's been invaded by its larger, much larger and former imperial neighbor. Uh, this is a country that has been uh, at various times forcibly uh you know made part of russia and or the soviet union for you know a, a, what, a at least several centuries depending on where you want to place that i mean the end of the polish lithuanian empire maybe if you want to you know go back that far but in any event um you know we find ourselves again in this very awkward uh, position where a lot of people who have, including people that I used to call friends and comrades, you know, that, uh, you know, profess to have an anti-war, uh, anti-imperialist politics that are just, just lying, just straight out lying about what's going on over there. I mean, as you noted, and I think correctly, Putin at various times, I mean, Putin lies, of course, he, you know, course. like, like all leaders do. Putin has, uh, you know, double meaning sometimes in things that he says, but in very real way, he was honest about several aspects of this war. And it's funny that so many leftists just ignore the fact that the war was begun with an openly and virulently anti-communist speech that Putin gave, in which he essentially, uh, not essentially, specifically singled out Lenin and Lenin's ideas about Ukraine as having created the problem. And when he talks about Lenin's ideas about Ukraine, what he's referring to is Lenin's support for self-determination for the people of Ukraine. And that was, you know, again, the Russian Empire, the prison house of nations, that whole history of the Russian Empire's evolution into what it became, the reason why Russia is a quote unquote multinational, you know, Russian Federation, why the Soviet Union was a multinational state, why the Russian Empire was multinational, right? These are all, there's a uh, uh, continuum of history here that has led us to this point. And, 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 a lot of these leftists are just ignoring the fact that when 
uh, uh, Ukraine emerges in that period, and the and and Lenin makes the point about self determination. It was Russian chauvinism that ultimately tamps that down. It is Stalin and Russian chauvinism that rejects Lenin's idea of Ukraine and all the peoples of the Russian Empire having self-determination, um, the right to self-determination, the right of nations to self-determination. I think this is at the root of a lot of this. When he says, when Putin says that Lenin placed a uh, ticking time bomb under Russia. What he means is that he gave the he gave people. I, I don't say he gave, but he articulated the idea that the people of the Russian Empire, the former Russian Empire, had the right to determine their own futures. And frankly, that's one of the most radical and most uh, uh, substantive ideas that uh, Lenin had about Ukraine and why it's so relevant today. And anyone who studied the, the fine grain of Soviet policy, particularly during the Stalin period, but also during the Khrushchev uh, and Brezhnev periods, one actually sees vast wavering and expanding and contracting. Um, I mean, one of the most fascinating things about, about, about the Stalin period, it's not consistently Russian chauvinist either. It's all over the place, depending yes. on the year. Um but that Russian chauvinism was allowed and encouraged and in many ways in the American vernacular, when we study this, if you're not a Russian speaker, you don't even pick up that um, the, the distinction between Russian and Soviet, because in the American mind, they're practically the same thing still to this day. Um, and that's, you know, a very unfortunate history. The, the limiting of national determination, particularly after um, the situation in Poland after World War II, uh, really, really changes the game. Um, and I find I find that fascinating. I also find it fascinating that so many people have missed the, the you know the references to the Ruski Mir, uh, you know the Russian world, and and the emphasis on on multipolarity. I have told people many, many times, uh, multipolarity in classic British um, uh, geopol geopolitics, which is where it comes from. I mean, it kind of uh, became a buzzword. At, uh, first in Zareed, I think people really forget this. First with Fareed Zakaria in 2006 and 2007, and then in uh, uh, Dugan circles around 2009, 2010, at least in English. It, it was probably used in Russia probably about five to six years earlier. Um, multipolarity is not anti-imperialism. No. Multipolarity is the politics of multiple imperial powers brokering uh, control over regions. And one of the most interesting problems that it historically has, and, and I want to get your thoughts on this, because I think this does actually explain uh, something that you wrote about uh, in an article on Counterpunch, I believe, or in a video you made for Counterpunch on November 3rd uh, of this year, um, why the global South, particularly Latin America, has trouble figuring out how to, how to pivot itself on this. Um, in a multipolar world, uh, small nations know they need a hegemon um, and it's best if the hegemon is far away. So Baltic states have every incentive to appeal to the U S and like Bolivia has every incentive to appeal to Russia and China. Um, there's kind of the, the obvious thing in the room that I think you and I can talk about a little bit later is that China's position on this and, it, and the effects this has had on China is not nearly clear uh, as clearly uh, pro-Russia as either the United States nor many pro-Chinese leftists want us to believe. Um, yeah, I totally but, agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think it's really hurt China in a lot of ways. Badly. Um, and, and also exposed China to the United States and to others who may have built up China in their minds more than was probably correct. Yeah, well, this this is one of the the things that I have, you know, been thinking about for many years. Is that a lot of people who talk about this don't actually know? Like they, like someone, for example, told me, "Well, isn't isn't uh, Russia our talkist? And I'm like, "It is on on food and on mineral wealth, but 
they don't manufacture that much anymore and haven't like pretty they haven't manufactured com consumer goods pretty much ever um except, you know even even during the the the, the bourgeoisification of the russian empire did they not manufacture that many consumer goods that really wasn't what they did um and uh with the failures of of Khrushchev, I mean, that was one of Khrushchev's major points was to develop a consumer goods economy in the in the Soviet sphere, and that was largely abandoned for main, for for heavy industry and military development. Um, that largely was maintained during the oligarchical period of of the uh, of the early nineties with Western. Sanction because the last thing I think the West wanted was a major industrial power actually having consumer goods on the market to compete with Western or even Chinese goods. Um, so, um, particularly given at how educated the Soviet uh, workforce was relative to the rest of the world, and honestly, even still is. I mean, the po post Soviet Russia. Uh, the the education level of the average Soviet city, citizen is higher than the United States, um, so that leads us in a kind of of weird place. And and for me, uh, it makes sense that a lot of people in the global south, at least a lot of political leaders in the global south, would feel the need to at least pay lip service to Russia. But you, would you like to go into your observations there? Sure. I mean, there's a lot to say, of course. I mean, th there's a very basic principle, I think, that needs to be understood. And that is that most of the global South has been on the receiving end of US and Western imperial violence for several centuries. So it's the most reasonable thing in the world to see that people in the global South aren't exactly receptive to Western pleas for humanitarianism and for uh, justice and, and so forth. So I think at a very basic level, and I mean, I, I hate to put it so simple, but I do think that at some point it is that simple that there is an immediate sort of uh, rejection of Western calls for uh, justice and for uh, rule of law and for all of the kinds of phrases that you hear from Biden and from uh, Western leaders. So there's that. There's also the historical legacy of Soviet support for anti-colonial struggles, particularly in Africa. Um, I, I think that most people know... Uh, even though they may not act like this, but most people do know that Russia of today is not the Soviet Union, that Russia, that, that the Soviet Union to, for what, you know, for the various reasons that it was doing, many of which were in advancement of its own agenda uh, to counter the United States, but some of it was ideological. Uh, and so there was a, there is a still somewhat of a residual sympathy towards Russia over that. There's also the fact that Russia's propaganda has been particularly effective in the global South as it is highlighted over and over again, the endless supply of examples of Western hypocrisy, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan, whether it was Vietnam, whether it was uh, support for apartheid South Africa, whatever it might be, uh, there are countless examples that the Russians are able to draw on in order to present themselves as, hey, we're not the real bad guys here. You know, I think we all know you know, wink, wink, who the real bad guys are. And that actually does land in a lot of places. And you have specific examples in, in Africa and in, in a country like Mali, uh, the military junta that's in charge of the government in Mali is backed by the Russians. Their security is guaranteed by the Russians. They, they're, that country is in effect, um, maybe not occupied by Russian troops, but it is something of a uh, sort of satellite of the Russians now. Same in Sudan, a military junta there, which is, by the way, repressing a very vibrant democracy movement that has been in the streets on and off for several years in the face of intense repression after the uh, ouster of uh, Bashir from power there several years ago. Uh, the Russians are providing security to, the, to, to that government as well. And oh, by the way, stealing their gold out of that country. So Russia is acting in a sort of a junior imperial, junior colonial sort of 
role here, but that doesn't really register on the global scale in comparison to the French, the British, the Americans. I mean, you get the idea. And so obviously, Latin America, even more so. The history of U.S. imperialism throughout Latin America means that much of Latin America views whatever the U.S. says as the opposite of reality. So you have uh, uh, you know leaders like Evo Morales who show tremendous sympathy towards Putin, even though I think, as you kind of noted, you know, that sympathy is more uh, calculated politics than it is genuine sympathy for Russia's position here. So that's one I think that's one element of this, that the the historical experience and then the, the, the propaganda from that experience informs a lot of this. I think also, frankly, and I, I mentioned I mentioned this several times when speaking about this, that. At a, at a basic level, there is a very significant lack of understanding of the nature of this war. And that is true throughout the global south. That is true actually in much of the world, not only in the global south, but since that's what we're talking about here, I think a lot of places in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia and elsewhere, they look at this and, and they think, what do I care? What do I care? You know, that this is, uh, you know, this is a bunch of, um, well, either Europeans or white people or whatever, fighting it out among themselves. This is not about us. Okay. That is a very real sentiment that you get from a lot of people. I've spoken to uh, people in India. I've spoken to people in other parts in Asia, in Latin America. The fact of the matter is a lot of people simply say, yeah, it's not good what's going on in Ukraine, but come on. You know what I mean? And like, unfortunately that's as, basic sort of simple lack of understanding is a big part of this. Very few people understand how Russia became the power that it became, what the prison house of nations meant, what Russian colonialism was about, why Russian culture and language spread in the way that it did, and why, the, as you noted, the Baltic states, the countries of Eastern Europe and elsewhere, why they're so uh, hesitant to believe any positive uh, uh, ideas coming out of Russia. So there's a historical legacy that I think a lot of parts of the world simply don't understand. And to the extent that they do understand it, they just don't care. Yeah, it. what I find fascinating about it is it seems like there is kind of an attempt to build a Cold War politics without actually any differing ideology. Exactly. Yeah, which is kind right. of which is which is which is kind of maddening, actually, because it's like, well, as I said, from the standpoint of Bolivia, I totally get what Evo Morales would say that. Of course. Is it, is it necessarily the, the, the smartest thing to do? Um maybe maybe not it's geopolitically sort of savvy um i think where you see real nuance actually is china for example i have pointed out that during the beginning of this war china never tapped down an internal protest around uh, against russia on this um they allowed pretty vociferous and somewhat nasty debates in weibo uh in weibo spaces around um uh support of russia there there has never been a you know there's a there's a sort of like tacit support uh of, of russia's right to national sovereignty while also talking about ukraine's right to defend itself which is often left out of western na narratives about this um which is not to say that china is totally innocent in fact china isn't and is having all kinds of problems related to it to the the acceleration of conditions which this has caused. Um, one of the things I think China has been most frustrated by from people I know who who follow China and from Chinese people I know is that before they started having their COVID problems recently, um, they thought they were able to make better trade deals and whatnot uh, with with Europe, particularly Germany, which there has been some outreach successfully on with the, the SPD and the Greens, but they met a wall in Europe. Uh, Europe was unified in ways it has not been, um, even in lieu of an energy crisis um, from European European faux greening. Um, so it's it's going to be interesting where this all goes. The Chinese, yeah. I mean, look, I I expected I expected that when 
when China sort of presented itself or maybe China allowed others to present it as this, you know, what did they, what did Putin and Xi Jinping call it? A forever partnership or Mm -hmm. whatever they, you know, whatever they said, a forever friendship, whatever the inane phrase they used was, right? So they were trying to convince everybody that they were just shoulder to shoulder and lockstep. Putin certainly needed to do that, right? But that was always a major question because it would, it became clear really from the very beginning of the conflict that the sanctions were coming. Economic war from the West was coming and it was coming quickly and it was going to smash into Russia like a ton of bricks, which it did. And of course, um, and by the way, that pun on bricks was not intended at all in this multipolarity context here. But um, but it's funny. Yes. Uh, well, it's. <laughs> That's debatable. <laughs> That's certainly debatable. Um, I think that um, the Chinese, you know, they were in a very strong position, right? One expected the Chinese to scoop up a lot of market share inside of Russia that had been lost by these Western corporations that were fleeing out of the country. That didn't happen. The Chinese didn't come in to try to buy up Russian industries for cheap. Russia didn't allow it. The Chinese weren't all that interested in buying up what they see to be junk, more or less, coming out of Russia economically, junk assets, assets that can't necessarily be traded on the international market and so forth. So it was really clear from the beginning that some of the economic uh, partnership that was assumed wasn't really there. Now, the other question, I mean, one of the big ones was microchips. Where are the Chinese in providing microchips and processors to the Russians? Well, severely lacking is the is is the operative word. Why? Because the Chinese are terrified of being caught up in an economic war from the West as well, being targeted by the West for you know helping Russia to evade the sanctions. China has allowed in in many ways it's allowed itself to be played into this very weird corner. And as you noted. China, I, I did a I did a whole video on this at some point uh, several months ago. China was viewed positively by almost uh, by by overwhelming majorities in almost every major European country before all of this in 2018 and 2019. China was seen in many ways as kind of Europe's potential alternative to total dependence on the United States and. Look at how quickly that has all eroded. The latest opinion polls, I, I, I don't have the figures in front of me, but in countries like uh, France and Germany, where China had, you know, uh, positive approval ratings of like, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent, that's now plunged. China is now essentially locked out of Europe economically. Europe is now much less interested in anything to do with Belt and Road, the, you know, China's uh, One Belt, One Road initiative for global economic yeah. development. And um, adding in all the currency crises that are happening around the world and the sovereign wealth issues we, we belt and road is a fish is, is more or less it's gone from being what i'd like to call the the mega marshall plan i mean it was 12 to, it's basically attempting to do to uh the the eurasian landmass what uh the u.s did with western europe and the anglophone countries um which was to build a integrated economic order and a non-hostile political order um and china was actually even kind of attempting to do it without pissing off the united states which is yes. kind of amazing as a, as a as as a strategy because they're like sure you guys can keep all the blue water we'll run all the land and the shallow water around eurasia and we'll do all this development that you're clearly not interested in doing in africa because one of the things that i've pointed out to people is outside of military interference the united states is remarkably absent from 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 africa in its um even in in extracted capacity which uh you know i'm always like no they're more pissed off about france and, and stuff like that <laughs> like like but us is barely there yeah yeah africom exists and and that is a serious issue um but the us has just been kind of not really any involved except to stop Chinese incursion in their eyes. And even then it hasn't tried very hard like at all. It's just been, it's pushed back on anything like military bases. 
Yeah, um, I mean, ask the people of Myanmar how much they've tried to like push the Chinese back a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, to your point, I mean, Belt and Road, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's like, you know, dead on arrival exactly. I mean, it, it will still exist. I mean, the, the projects aren't disappearing. But I mean, if you look at the maps of Belt and Road um, and what was proposed or what was envisioned for Belt and Road, there were going to be multiple, uh, um, you know, routes across Eurasia. One of those routes was the northern route. It went through Russia. Well, you could forget about that. OK, because that's not happening anytime soon. Russia is effectively removed from the capitalist, the global capitalist economic uh, system at this point, not only in terms of their you know, cash reserves and the sanctions and everything else. But I mean, from a political perspective, Russia is very hard to count on for anything economic. Right. I mean, unless you're, you know, an Indian oil trader who's buying their oil for a 50 percent discount and turning around and selling it on markup to other countries. I mean, sure. Sure. Then you're interested in what Russia has to offer, but otherwise, not really. Um, the southern route for the Belt and Road is also a, a, an open question. Security concerns in Pakistan and Afghanistan raise very real worries for the Chinese. Are the Chinese going to have to make deals with the Taliban? Can the Taliban even provide security to any of these uh, highways and, and and other things that the Chinese wanted to build? Um, you know, so there are huge questions yeah. for the Chinese uh, with regard to that. But more to the point about Ukraine, the Chinese are really worried that this is, as you noted, it's created, it's essentially split the global economy in, in some ways, not so much East and West, but Russia and China get isolated here. The Chinese currency can't do what the U.S. currency does. It doesn't. It's not a free floating currency. It's not the kind of market that people can, uh, you know, park their money in. China can't operate in the global economy the way the United States can, and that makes a lot of countries around the world that were previously in bed with the Chinese extremely nervous. Well, I mean, basically, right now, what what we've seen is the massive devaluation of the euro and the pound um, because of the situation in Europe. The complete collapse of the ruble, except to buy Russian gas. Um, which which did stop the ruble from totally collapsing since it has to be traded in Russian uh, and Russian you have to trade in rubles to get Russian gas. But people, uh, I remember a lot of leftists early on were like, "Well, that means the dollar dominance is ending." I'm like, "No, <laughs> yeah. actually, trading in rubles is to get dollars, you idiot! Like it's the back door get I stuff." Know. Um, it it's actually dumbest. made the dollar stronger. <laughs> um, I know. Um, it's the dumbest thing. It's just the, the end of the dollar is the dumbest uh, constant discussion on the left. Because, like, I mean, if you look at it, I mean, everybody, anybody who wants to see U.S. imperialism collapse or, you know, you know, taken apart or whatever, understands that the dollar is at the heart of U.S. imperial power. This is clear. But just because the you know just because things are changing globally, it doesn't mean that the econ that the global economy is somehow going to be able to operate without the dollar. The U.S. Treasury market, for God's sake, is is bigger than anything else anywhere in the world. The there is nothing that comes even close to the dollar. There was an analysis done by the IMF recently. Um, I did a I I don't remember. I did a video on it at some point, but it basically looked at the move of uh, global global reserves held in dollars over the last twenty five years. And it went from like something like 75% of global reserves being held in dollars to 69%. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it moved the dollar definitely decreased its total global share, but I mean, it didn't decrease it to the ruble. It decreased it to like the Swiss franc, the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, all of these other local currencies that can be used by those countries in various capacities, right? So like, again, I, it's just, it's a misunderstanding of the nature of uh, U.S. imperialism, of the, of the global uh, capitalist system. And uh, more to the point, it also completely misrep misread what Russia's own monetary policy was doing. Russia was concerned about total freefall of the currency. So they jacked its interest rates to 20%. What do you think that did to every, to every Russian consumer? I mean, every Russian consumer is significantly poorer now than they were when this war began. And as Boris Kagerlitsky told me when I was uh, chatting with him a couple of months ago, things were bad before the war. 
things are getting worse now and they will be worse tomorrow and worse still the day after that. And that is how the people in Russia are viewing the current situation. And I don't think that should be overlooked either. One thing I think we, we really have to uh, deal with um, on this, you know, I talk about this from the standpoint of economics and we can talk about it in, in military. I always think you learn more. I always tell people, if you want to understand uh, global politics, don't read definitely don't read like foreign policy mag F don't read left financial mag. times you the financial read the financial times. times actually i would say now read read european and, and british financial papers american financial papers no longer seem to be as trustworthy in so much that they seem to buy a lot of their own fumes these days but i also don't suspect they're being read by by uh by businesses in the same way they used to be either um because everyone has access to things like the financial times best coverage of the best coverage of the war without a doubt is the financial times yep. i i un, un, i mean that pink paper man they are very very good at covering the issues it's it, they've also been very good on covering things like the problems developing in china the zero COVID, yes. uh, the 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 bind china's in with zero covid um and um which which has opened it up. Uh, one of the reasons why it's such a bind is China has a lot of vaccine hesitancy, which people in the West don't know about. And I, I actually don't have a good explanation as to why it does. That is still not clear to me. Um, and China has a very aging population. A lot of it's still working. And without the COVID protections, they could, you, they could literally lose hundreds of thousands of people very quickly, even with a fairly mild by by what happened in the United States and Europe standards, COVID breakout just by dealing with population and aging alone. Um, yeah, and I'm not an expert on it, but from what I understand, their vaccine is considered subpar as well in terms of its performance. Um, yeah, the, uh, they they did not invest in vaccine boosters for the various other um, strains that have come along. Um, the other thing that we have to admit is 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 China does not have. Uh, a robust socialized medical care, which I think people in the West are actually shot by like, no, they, their, their medical system is actually probably more similar to the United States than almost anywhere else in the world. Um, and and it, it, it's weird hybrid model, uh, largely privatized very with state ownership for parts of it. Um, and while they can do emergency mobilization very well, they have not built up capacity either. And, and between that and what we've seen uh, in the global south, and let, let's also not drop that there was almost a war between India and China in the beginning of the COVID situation, which we've completely forgotten about. Um, like there were shots fired. So, um, and Xi's projection of 5% growth over the next five years, nobody, including most Chinese analysts, think that's going to happen now. Um, how could what? it? It's, yeah. it's it's impossible. So so everyone's like, well, the U.S. is declining. I'm always like, yes, the U.S. is declining. The U.S. is a massive integrated empire, which everybody but Russia is tied into. Everybody else declines with it. Correct. Like, like it like it's like a massive tether to most of the other world powers, and ironically, it's sinking the slowest. Um. I mean, I think we've seen Europe go off just like kind of like if you looked at like inflation, uh, import export ratios, uh, cost of living, the value of the euro and the pound. We've just seen like Europe basically lose its status actually as one of the premier powers incredibly quickly in this situation. Um, it's still a dope global dominant pound, don't get me wrong, but it, it used to tie with the United States and China and that whole three-way most productive um, economies in the world thing, and that is not happening anymore. Um, and all this is a result of basically, you know, and, and this is where I am somewhat sympathetic. I, I'm not a person who, who, for example, will get my views on Ukraine by watching Oliver Stone documentaries. Um no, no. Uh, hmm. <laughs> um, well, but, now I, now I, now I, now I consider your views suspect. Yes, <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> I, 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 uh, 
I I do I do think there there is a the West, and I don't just mean the United States. And this is one one thing that I've pointed out to people. Like I think uh, the deal that was almost brokered right before Euro Maidan was not scuttled by the U.S. It was scuttled by by uh, particularly Germany, but by the EU in particular, um, by by breaking down the EU deal and the deal uh, which would allow the Ukraine to have a kind of trade relationship with Russia because Russia was not opposed to um, Ukraine being part of the EU. Uh, in fact, that might have been good for them. It was opposed to Ukraine being part of NATO. Um, and traditionally, uh you know, when 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 the EU gets retracted, NATO gets offered. That is how this has gone. And I definitely see how a bunch of different forces took advantage of that. Um, I was I was skeptical of all sides in the Euro Maidan debates, but most people in America saw it as you know uh, Central Asia and Eastern Europe occupy because they didn't know anything. Um, and then as a bunch of Nazis, again, because they didn't know anything. Uh, and I have wondered, you know, what could have been done? Because I, I do think, for example, you know, Putin is a, is a right-wing capitalist, quasi-religious uh soft dictator i say soft dictator because there is still some constitutional power he's he is still remaining within the formal realms of law but you know <laughs> uh, laws are funny things yeah you know? laws get 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 fudged around in russia pretty pretty regularly yeah. um but i do think um he was a rational one as far as they go like i was actually surprised you know, I'm I my first error was this error I always make is like, oh, the worst Russia is going to do is what they did in Georgia. It's going to be really annoying. NATO is going to wave flags. Uh, they're just going to like double down in the in the in the separatist republic republic areas, and it's it's going to be a more militized reminder of the status quo. And then I saw the beeline for Kiev, and I was like, fuck. Like, but then He's I was also it. yeah, but then I was also surprised how poorly they did. Yep. Like, and, and this is with the Ukrainian army that in the first two months was kind of in shambles. Yep. Like, um, but I reminded people that, that, uh, fourth generation warfare is not just for the United States. <laughs> like, like, uh, the, the, the calculus of an occupied country will always fight harder and take more losses than an occupying country particularly once that occupying country starts to have to draft people um, because the calculus is, is survival, cultural survival on one hand, and maybe literal survival in some cases um, uh, are expansion. The, the, the people fight differently hard for these scenarios. And, and ironically, you know, uh, we learned this um, with, Al Qaeda fighting the U.S. We learned it with um, Vietnam. Vietnam. We've learned it with. I guess we haven't learned it, but we definitely well, no, experienced no, it. it. <laughs> we have we have put it in military textbooks by military <laughs> figures and then proceeded to immediately ignore it. Ignore <laughs> it. Yep. Let me put that like we don't listen because uh, I might say fourth generation warfare is actually from the U.S. military, <laughs> but they just continually don't pay attention to their own research. But um, uh, which which is also. As a, as a side note, because I think I, I want to think talk about what we saw with Afghanistan leading up to this. I have had the theory that our that our that our imperial leaders are Hadrian's walling this motherfucker. Like they are they are no longer in an expansivist mode, particularly now that there is a worldwide move to decarbonize. And so the the, the Middle East is of much less uh, strategic importance to United States planners. I mean, one thing that I think people don't pay attention to is 
the U.S. hasn't really needed foreign oil um, in about a decade. So we are North American oil independent. Between us and Canada, we can produce enough for ourselves. For the immediate future, we're all going to have problems with oil very soon. But, but, you know, comparatively to the rest of the world, um, what the U.S., seems to have been concerned about in the past was oil futures and they're no they don't even seem that concerned about that anymore so i find that to be a fascinating problem for the anti-imperialist who who kind of thinks in the blood for oil mentality of the early aughts you know when i entered you know i was an anti-imperialist before i was a leftist in fact i was a right-wing one you know way back in my early 20s um uh and I probably would have been suckered in by some of the things right now, actually, from the right um, back then. But uh, what I, rem you know, I remember the blood for oil narratives. And then I remember even in the case of Iraq, realizing that that wasn't really true, that that was not what that war was actually about, that there's multiple reasons for that war, a lot of which were geopolitical. But it and, and yes, uh, of course. Uh, there's a lot of profiteering, but oil profiteering really wasn't exactly what that was going on there, at least not in the actual pulling out of barrels from from the Iraqi sands and sending it to the United States. It, there was stuff going on with like oil market shenanigans, um, but that's something kind of different. But that was harder to sell to leftists when I realized it. I, as I was becoming more of a leftist, I re had this realization, and I was like, "Well, you know." And, and admittedly, this was before, this was before and during early two thousand seven, back when Marxism was still kind of like, "Well, there was five of us," you know. In fact, you, yeah, you probably remember those days, sure. like, 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 like when no Marxist organization had more than four or five thousand people in the United States. Period. Um during that time period um that's the mentality we developed and then during during most of the obama period one of the most frustrating things for me on the left was that the us left like quit talking about international anything at all actually mm -hmm. yep um except a little bit about syria i'm being totally lost on it but like um during from from sanders to sanders like you could have just you know, other than, you know, tell Israel to be nicer to Palestine. Um, there was very little talk of geopolitics whatsoever. Um, with the exception of what was going on in Syria, of which of which almost nobody I talked to in the United States had a fucking clue. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, me, me included for a lot of that period um, on on a lot of these issues as well. I mean, you know, I, I readily admit that I didn't fully appreciate the complexity of what was happening in Syria. From the beginning, I saw the when uh, the initial uprising happened in 2011 and immediately followed by what became the sort of early stages of the violent repression of the uprising. Um, you know, I basically coming off of the, you know, emotional uh, uh you know whatever trauma or whatever you could say uh of what was done to libya which had been just several months earlier um that you know my narrative was that the united states was basically trying to create an afghanistan type scenario in syria which was of course backed up by many articles in the new york times and elsewhere about cia arms going to syrian rebels and picking the rebels that they liked versus the rebels they didn't like and so forth right and you know i knew about the local coordinates coordinating councils, the national coordinating committees, and the various organizations that had grown up, but I had kind of seen them as having been swept aside by, you know, these radical sort of uh, 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 criminal gangs that operated under a jihadi ideology. And, you know, I ran with that for several years, and it wasn't until I engaged with um, writings of uh, Syrian communists, actually, that really made me start to think like, well, wait a second, I don't know that I'm really appreciating the full scope of what's happening here. And I'm certainly don't want to be 
I don't want to find myself on the same side as like the global far right and like a brutal dictator and on the opposite side from like Syrian communists. Like that's weird. That's a weird position for me to be in. So I had to reevaluate that. I read a lot. I talked to a lot of different people and I sort of came to appreciate that I had gotten a lot of it wrong. I'd gotten some of it right and a lot of it wrong. And that was also true in the Maidan period and in, in, in 2014 in Ukraine as well. And part of that has to do, and I think it's important to note because this is an important phenomenon for people to understand. Part of that has to do with getting in, getting into and being surrounded by what you know, is essentially the uh, Russian propaganda echo chamber that exists within the, you know, sort of segment of the left online space, uh, you know, that kind of overlaps with conspiracy circles and left wing anti imperialist circles and, uh, you know, various other uh, alternative media circles that I used to travel in and, and, and traveled in for a long time. So anyway, the point here being that a lot of people, as you noted, were lost on Syria and were lost on Ukraine. But part of the reason that so many people were lost was because a, they didn't understand understand the nature of the conflicts and B, Russia's propaganda around both of those was quite effective because it right. played on a lot of the things that we experienced, the the skepticism that we have about uh, about U.S. media after war weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, right? Playing off of that to say, well, do you really believe that what they're saying is true about Ukraine, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's that, right? And so it's it was a it was an effective way that the Russians were able to propagate their narratives, and in fact, it's one of the reasons why uh, Russia's propaganda has been so effective. Yeah, I think this is actually really a really important thing to talk about. Like I, I, my, my relationship to Syria, it was complicated by two facts. One, I knew Alawites, believe it or not. I knew Alawite immigrants who took jobs. Uh, they were Canadian nationals. They took jobs in South Korea. And so I heard their side of the ethnic conflicts. And then I lived in Egypt. Um, a few years later, and saw the fallout of both Russian and American violence. Um, and I saw the anger of Syrian refugees at both of them. Like, uh, this was... Th th this was a... Something that I, I... They really felt like they were screwed over by international interference, including American interference, quite frankly. I mean, this is... This is not something I think that needs to be played down. Um, most of what you said about what was happening on on the situation on the ground um, in Syria is factually partly true. It just isn't all of the story. Yep. And what I came away from talking to people uh, who were. Now, admittedly, if they're talking to me, they're speaking English, so there is a certain amount of educational bias. But but from refugees uh, and a mixture of English and broke and really broken Arabic um, in in Egypt, was that I didn't really like. There was no real good side in that war at a certain point, but the initial um, anger with the government was quite real and yeah. not foreignly fomented. Um, but you know, like flies to shit, everybody tried to use it for their proxy interest. And by everybody, I don't just mean the U S and the Russians. I also mean there were, there was politics going on between, um, the Iranians and the Saudis, the, the Qataris and the Saudis, um, the there Israelis, was the Israelis who are everywhere and playing multiple sides. I mean, like. It was all it, it, when I started mapping out, even just you know, even trying to understand this from like, oh, it's Sunni versus Shia versus West versus East. Nope, that's not how that that was really not how it was working either. You started to draw who was aligned to who and where and why, and you're like, this is a this is like the Balkans in 1910. I yes. mean, um, 
And, and there's 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 patronage networks, there's familial ties, there's regional dynamics to it. There's you know there's all, there's so many different elements to it, which is why I I it, it was one of those things where it was like the more I learned about it, the more I realized how little I actually understood it. Really, you know. So. Yep. Uh, me too. And mine what mine was the experience of just talking to refugees on the ground when I was lived in Egypt, and then also I mean I did hear the Alawite side of the story. Um, and at first I was highly sympathetic to that, uh, because that was my first like experience of people I knew from Syria and what they were concerned about. Um, and often that does shape your vision, but I, I just came away going like, oh, wow, this is, this is a mess. I mean, it's ironically a mess from, from Western imperialism <laughs> in the first place, like, like so many things, it goes back to like, why the fuck did they draw maps this way? You know, uh, at the end of World War II, why did they mess with Pan-Arabism in the 70s when there is like the the joint Arab state with Syria and Egypt? You know, I mean, I know why they did, but it, it's just, it becomes very apparent, like, well, this has been set up to fail from moment one, um, which kind of happened. And Russian interest in that were not neutral but yeah there was plenty of stuff that we were lied to about i mean the, the the for example uh one of the the chemical weapons attacks things yeah that was that was propaganda there, there was propaganda involved but the i i'm always just fascinated by the idea that people think that only the u.s is doing propaganda it's just like no there, None of these states have any incentive to tell the truth as states, guys. Like, come on. Well, and the other aspect of that is this 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 weird uh, sort of method of trying to quote unquote debunk things by pointing to one area where there may be some discrepancies, and it's like. Okay, so you are pointing to what you think are discrepancies, which are debatable, depending on which experts you ask from the, uh, uh, you know, the um, or, uh, OPCW, you know, the Chemical Weapons Agency. Um, there are, there are, there are, you know, questions about one of the incidents, except the problem is that there were like four dozen chemical incidents. Were they all fake? Or was it just that one was maybe exaggerated or several were embellished or what is it? In other words, it's like, again, because the New York Times lied about WMD, therefore everything in the New York Times is a lie. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. The world is not neat like that. You can't just ignore everything that is said if it doesn't comport with what you think and then just focus on all the things that just, it's like, here's an example. I, there were there are plenty of people uh, on the left who call themselves anti-imperialists who will say um, Amnesty International is like controlled by George Soros or whatever, and it's soft it's soft power of the United States, and you can't believe what they say about uh, Syria. And then, like next week, they will cite the Amnesty International report on Palestine, you know, because that is you know comporting with their political position. In other words, it's very Trumpian, actually, picking and choosing which facts you would like to incorporate and which facts you would like to ignore. So when the New York Times reported that the CIA was sending arms to Syrian rebels, that was facts that they were okay with. But when the New York Times reported uh, about a chemical attack, they'd say, well, that's fake. New York Times always fit pedals lies about WMDs, right? It's it's like trying to win a debate more than it is trying to get to the facts. And also, we, let's talk about let's talk about why the New York Times pushed the lies on WMDs. It wasn't like the New York Times is the people who manufactured that. It was the U.S. Intelligence Department. Actually, it was the British Intelligence Department giving what the U.S. Intelligence Department wanted uh to it um i don't the british right. often do this I, I, that's a whole different question and i'm not going to go into that today but i i was very frustrated by like yeah the media sucks because they trust state sources you are also by the way just trusting different state sources 
all of whom on both sides of this equation have every reason to lie. And since it's almost impossible to get into some of these countries safely without government um, sponsorship and access, what are you going to do? Now, I realize that we should, like, you know, I used to joke that if, if Trump killed NATO, it'd be one of the few good things that happened in the world. Like, um, and I wasn't totally joking about that, but, but it what it is interesting to me that this is why people believe bullshit like horseshoe theory actually is like, well, where do you hear this stuff from? You hear it from marginal political actors who have who have very little accountability and whose money sources we often have no idea what they are. Mm -hmm. um, um, now, does that mean you should trust the New York Times? No, because New York Times usually does report the lies it's told as truth, but it's not making them up. It's it's just trusting without verifying. Um and I'm actually, you know, that's probably true in a lot of cases. Uh, back when RT America was still a thing, and I'm, you know, I'm mixed on what happened there. Um, I always said, like, on certain things, you should trust, you know, RT about the U.S. government because it has an incentive to tell you the truth. But on certain things, you absolutely shouldn't because you should think about what it would have, in, what as a state media operation would it have incentive to at least play down. Not necessarily lie about, just play down. What would it have an incentive to overstate about the U.S.? Um, this is true not just for that. It's true for Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera Arabic are entirely different newspapers for a reason. Um, it's true for... Fuck, it's true for the BBC. Like, it's true for NPR. Like, we know we have to read these state sources critically, and we know we have to read non-state sources who trust state sources critically. Um, that doesn't change when it's another state. Like, um, there are states that are more responsible. I tend to find China pretty responsible on a lot of things, um, particularly when it's talking about uh, foreign influence. I, I you know, I... Um, I think one of the things that I said that pissed a lot of people off recently is China's the most responsible capitalist government. And they got mad that it called China capitalist. I'm like, what? But they are. Um, <laughs> that was the thing they got mad about? Yeah. I, I have weird fans. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I used to, as a side note, I used to lament, like, I miss all the old Maoists. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like I'm going to get my, I'm going to get my red book and wave it at you here. shortly. <laughs> I'm always like, yeah, I miss all the old Maoists because they, they didn't believe that anything after Tung was legitimate. Um, but anyway, um, my, my, I think the left, unfortunately, you know, one of the one of the th interesting things when we talk about the left, we're also talking about left media spaces because, like, the political left in America pretty much doesn't really exist. Um, not I in guess. this way, not, 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 not on this kind of issues. It, it exists in localized struggles. It exists at a, you know, municipal level and whatnot, but yeah, you, know, you might have, like, you could arguably say there's some reformist vaguely leftist Congress people in the squad, but, yeah. but, but their, their leftism gets checked out the moment we talk about foreign policy. <laughs> Like, yeah, and I mean, you know, but I mean, you, you you have like radical left organizations that do exist, whether they're tenants' rights organizations or yeah, what yeah. have you, you know, and they do, but they don't operate. They don't operate in a cohesive way in the way that you would like to think when you say the left, right? There is no the left. There's just tons and tons and tons of people and organizations doing their things, and it's not just that nobody was able to get them together. The left is uh, the left is a fucked up place, man. It's, it's a fucked yeah. up place. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, th that's right. The left is is we should think about the left as multi 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 vocal, primarily local. There there is no it doesn't really go up to a national level. Um, it it doesn't have any real party representation. Sorry, third party people, you don't really matter outside no. of local stuff. Uh, and where you and this is what I find frustrating. This is what I kind of understood from the Bernie to Bernie period that I was talking about where the left kind of just forgot that the rest of the world existed. <laughs> um, 
we we always find geopolitics kind of in the worst way at the worst times. And what I mean by that is it becomes like a fandom in a time of left powerlessness. Like, and particularly after we thought we had power. And I think one of the things that the Bernie situation reminded us is we really kind of didn't. And we have seen where people cut, whether or not they become progressive Democrats or whether or not they're willing to go back to what was, I don't know, the 40 year status quo of the left before that. Um, not, not that that's great, but it's just something that like we are back in the wilderness again. But my point is we kind of always were. We never like the, the 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 feeling that we weren't was kind of an illusion. Oh, I um, totally agree with that. I <laughs> could not agree with that anymore. Um and and uh um I find it interesting that that's when we focus on foreign policy the most because that's the thing that we have the least power about. And so I always talk about this and people wonder why I do so much stuff on, I do lots of stuff on foreign policy. I'm like, because you need to know it, you need to understand it. Um, you need to, you need to see it. If you're going to build ties, you need to build ties closer to you and your integrated work chain. So that's going to be Canada, Mexico, uh, the Caribbean, uh, people more immediately affected like by U S imperialism. Cause they're right here. Um, solidarity to people who've been victimized by us but you do kind of have to have the realization that like yelling at the squad as much as they suck and you know call them out for hypocrisy all day i'm totally okay with that um but that's not having any real effect on foreign policy at all um and you have to to get to a point where we could have internationalism and actually affect on power and policy, we'd have to admit right now that we don't. And in so much that we're pushing different people's lines. And I also, you know, we've been talking about a lot of the Russia stuff. I mean, let's, let's be very clear. There are more people who are crazy NATO apologists on the broad quote unquote left than the people we're talking about. We just, you and I just deal more with anti-imperialists. So we have a, a different concerns. I mean, are there are there I, I'm gonna I'm I'm questioning that. I mean, maybe you're right, maybe not. Um are I see a lot of NATO apologia coming from at least what I would consider what I would consider to be left liberals. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't really I don't think of them as like leftists for the most part. I mean, there is some of that, but um and again, I mean, it depends on it depends on, you know, how you look at it. What do you call NATO apologia? You know, to me, uh, uh, NATO apologia is basically saying NATO is better than Russia. NATO and, the, and NATO countries are the better option than Russia. They are qualitatively better. Um, and that is actually I do see a lot of people say that. But I see most of the people who say that to be liberals for the most part. Um, I do see some discussion on the left about whether or not to uh, openly uh, uh, advocate for peace now, which is basically to say that Ukraine should enter into negotiations to negotiate away a portion of its country, or peace as an abstract concept. Well, I'm for peace. Well, what does that mean? Exactly. Exactly. What does peace mean? What is it? What is it? What does it look like? Are you for making peace with the guy who kicked in your door and is stealing your TV? Do you make peace with him? I mean, I'm for peace as well, but how do we how do we get there? Right. So NATO apologia to me, which is a very real uh, uh, issue, I think it has multiple levels to it. Can you call somebody who lives in Lithuania a NATO apologist? I don't Absolutely really think not. so. You know, so again, what we're really talking about is a smaller sliver of the international left, which is mainly those leftists that are in the United States and maybe Britain and what, you know, a handful of other countries and what their orientation is supposed to be. Um, I, for one, happen to believe that uh, uh, peace is a real thing. It's not just a concept. It has to exist in material reality, in the material world. Peace can be absolutely achieved in Ukraine. It could be achieved tomorrow. Russia withdraws its troops. Right. But nobody thinks that's realistic. Nobody thinks that's going to happen. So you're not just going to say, well, I demand peace and I demand that Russia leave Ukraine immediately. OK, great. You've demanded that. So what? 
It doesn't mean anything. And this is where the performative politics comes in. A lot of the left likes to perform leftist politics, but doesn't actually engage in what real leftist politics would mean. So to your point about having an ability to affect foreign policy, right? You have to be like on Ukraine, for example, you have to be engaged with people in Ukraine, trade unions, organizations in Europe, trade organizations and, and human rights organizations and others that are that are intimately involved to create pressure on governments, governments that maybe aren't the United States aren't as immune to pressure as the U.S. government is. Governments in Europe and elsewhere, there are ways of doing this, but it requires uh, direct engagement with the people involved in the conflict or the people affected by the conflict and, and uh, engagement at an institutional and an organizational level. The guys that are out there trying to make bucks on YouTube by, you know, cheerleading for a Donetsk People's Republic that doesn't exist or, you know, cheerleading for Putin or whatever. I mean, these people, they're, they're going to do what they do. They're exploiters. They're, you know, parasitical or whatever. But the people that are genuinely interested in, in, in achieving something, I mean, they have to understand that if you're on the left, you see the institutional forces that you can affect, trade unions, local groups, and others, and you try to work there, right? I mean, isn't that what it means to organize? I, I would totally uh, agree with that. One thing I would even further is I also think you have to do it in Russia. Um, 100%, totally. Um, and Harder, it, harder in Russia, but yes. One thing that we're going to do uh, on what's going to be a separate show for our listeners, but I'm just going to out that it's going to be recorded at the same time, is talk about Russian literary and, and uh, high culture, um, because I don't like anti-Russian sentiment. I don't like anti-Russian hey. people sentiment. I, I fucking decide it. And what, what, what bugs me even more now is that at least during the fucking Cold War, like people were kind of interested in. In, in Russian culture as in the understanding the enemy fucked up criminology way. There were whole university departments dedicated to tr trying to understand Soviet culture and society. I mean, you know, the, some Nobel Prize winners every decade for those things. Right. And, you know, and, and they also produced, they produced some skitty pop. Uh, yeah, they, they produced some Richard Pipes and some some uh robert spencers uh but they also produced jay author gettys and stephen <laughs> cohen and many yeah, others stephen yeah. cohen uh even to some degree sean guillory like you know you know who you know people that i've interviewed <laughs> so it's 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 important to understand that um and i am worried about the the shutting off to understanding the average russian um and the russian mindset now uh particularly in regards to europe um but also just you know i mean it feels very similar like when people were pro i mean it, it didn't last very long but when people were like oh i'm not gonna sell vodka and i'm like dude that vodka is not even made in russia um and and I'm sort like this a, sort of a freedom fries scenario. Yeah, it very much felt like you know the shit we pulled in 2002 <laughs> about the French, which was also hilariously misguided. Now, 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 children, for those of you that weren't alive at that time, the French <laughs> were very skeptical of the uh, Bush uh, war in Iraq, and part of that led to uh, right wing patriots in the United States creating freedom fries to replace French fries. Anyway, yep. yeah, and, and mass pouring away like dumping of french wine <laughs> uh yeah it was it was uh kind of hilarious um also because some of their skepticism had to do with who were fucking with their imperialism <laughs> um, but whole different problem yes um no, I agree with you. Anti-Russian sentiment really is 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 awful as far as I'm concerned. There's the problem is that um uh a tremendous lack of understanding about Russia and Russian society, the Russian mind, et cetera, that then leads to a lot of this kind of misunderstanding. I mean, a lot of people don't, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, Russians are as politically engaged as people in the West and they aren't. Uh, Russia, you know, is a historically very apolitical society, at least in the last, uh, you know, in 
modern history. I mean, Russian people had no political rights or representation of any kind, really, leading up to 1917. So for much of the Ru Russia's history, there was no political culture of any kind unless you were in the court of the czar or whatever. And then, you know, in the period of the uh, of the Soviet Union, for reasons that I obviously don't need to explain here, there wasn't a real politics. There was the party. And if you were involved in politics, to whatever extent you could be, you were involved in the party. And the party was politics and politics was the party. And that was that. Um, and, um, you know, there was underground politics, I guess, to some degree, but for the most part, not. And Part of the survival mechanism for Russians through the generations has been to stay apolitical, to leave politics to that 10 or 15 percent that engage in it. And unfortunately, that is one of the things that we've seen in the we saw this in the early part of the war in Ukraine. A lot of people in Russia just didn't even didn't even pay attention to it. I mean, it's like nice. it's just like like another cut, like another planet. You know what I mean? It's just happening in some other place or it's not really a thing or to the extent that it is. But honestly, it's, the way Americans often view our wars. To yes, be quite frank. actually. <laughs> yes. And I, I made that point as well, although in 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 a in a way, um, I hate to say it, but like, you know, in the U.S., there is at least some semblance of a kind of um, uh, civic culture that doesn't really exist in russia either it's one of the tremendous failings of russian society and it's one of the my uncle is a professor at hunter college he's written many books on uh you know russian humor and russia and you know being an immigrant from soviet union and so forth and you know one of the things that he 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 talks about with me is you know about this the fact that in the soviet union there was no sense of civic responsibility or civic duty because everything was just controlled and one of the ways that you survived was to kind of focus on yourself your family your circle of friends and to just kind of live that way you know and there is a sense of that um you know so anyway i don't want to go off on a tangent about that other than to say that uh i think that russian society is complicated and as uh and and very badly misunderstood and i think that you know as you already noted you know russia's cultural production is so I mean, it's so important for 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 so many different reasons that it's a it's a real tragedy if Russia's uh, criminal war in Ukraine leads to a sort of, I don't know, a, 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 for, a forgetting of what Russia is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, if, I don't have many nationalist bones in my body, and in so much that I do, it is for old country in Bulgaria um uh and and scotland <laughs> so because that's you know where my ancestors come from and uh and when i say that i say that tongue in cheek because i really don't have a whole lot of patience for any kind of nationalism i mean even even scottish independence which i i, I guess i support because fuck the english um i'm a little skeptical of um particularly now that the situation is what it is with the eu uh However, in the situation with with Eastern European nationalism, I think is is an interesting problem because the national the, the national movements were themselves many in many ways early Bolshevik projects. In some ways, I mean, they were trying to invent national identities for people so that they could have some autonomy in the system um and then this gets caught up in 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 the cold war courting it off and uh waves of russianification and de-russification um and in a way it becomes ironic because you know, one of the, I, I always do make the joke well the only person who ever could figure out how to ethnically sort Central and Eastern Europe was actually Stalin even Hitler couldn't do it. Um, but in, in another way, like there's a real sense that after 1992, a lot of these places are dealing with the problems that like the rest of Europe and the settler colonial countries dealt with in the early 20th, late 19th century. Um, and so, you know, national solidarity uh, and that sort of thing has a lot more appeal, I think, when you don't have, I don't know, uh, a century and a half of it being obvious bullshit. Um, uh, you, uh, but behind you. So, 
you know, I mean, I and I think that to me, even Amer like American hard patriots are not, you know, as nationalistic as they are. They're kind of not. They don't have a cultural nationalism really uh, that's consistent from area to area. Uh, uh, that we could debate that, but like, it's something that I've observed. It's like, well, the the MAGA people don't actually share culture really. Um, uh, th th there is not a red state and blue state America. It's more like a bunch of fragmented cultures that project onto these political labels um, and a common language. Um, and, and similarly, I think that that this is kind of a problem for, for Eastern Europe because in so much that we believe in national determination, and I more or less mostly do, um, we do have to deal with the fact that this is not going to be an easy thing for this tangled mess that was left over from 1992. And I, I would like to remind people that if 1992 had not had happened, a lot of these problems would not exist. Um, uh, but, you know, in many ways, we have no one to blame for 1992. And we can blame the West. But the Soviet Union <laughs> did a lot to itself uh, to make that happen. Um, so I think as a left, we have to, we have to reckon with that. And I think one of the things I think is so interesting about this time period right now, and I think we see it in like the liberals who like want to pull up cold war imagery too, is we don't really have a good narrative for it where we, the, t the period of history, in which this resembles is pre the beginning of like the Fordist modern capitalist mind. Um, it is the 19th, the long 19th century that, that this actually resembles more of than the cold war. I've been saying that now for uh, almost a decade actually. And like the more things happen, the more that seems abundantly clear to me. And yet people reach for the, you know, the, the, the last narrative where I'm like, no, you really need to go to like, I don't know, 1875 to start see and, and just move britain to america and and that's what you're actually seeing right now except what's different is we now have nuclear bombs which completely changes all the equations um and and i i admit i don't know what to do about that we talk about peace peace is a very relative thing i don't know how you deal with the situation in Ukraine without admitting that like, yeah, it's going to be hard to figure out how to ever incorporate say Crimea back into the country. Right? I agree. I agree right. with you. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, Crimea, unfortunately is one of those issues that I, I, as much as I would like to say that what's right is right. And Crimea should have never been forcibly, uh, you know, seized from Ukraine and annexed into Russia. Uh, I have a hard time seeing how we get, out of the situation we're in now where Crimea is Russia, at least according to Russia. Um, and Russia is really the only one that matters in that equation. If they think it's Russia, it's Russia. Why? Because they have their naval fleet in Sevastopol and you are not going to forcibly remove Russia's Navy out of Crimea without launching a full scale war. Right. So again, part of the issue was and, and, and that itself is a legacy of 1991, 1992, as you mentioned, because when Ukraine uh, gained its independence, that was one of the concessions that was ultimately made was that the Russians would be able to continue to maintain their fleet, their bolt, their uh, Black Sea fleet in Crimea and their, their, their major naval base there. That is the warm water port. That is one of the critical military necessities for Russia historically. There's a reason why Catherine the Great built the city of Odessa, which is where my family comes from. There's a reason why warm water ports were so critical for the Russians throughout history and why they're not likely to give up Crimea uh, without escalating to some kind of a full-scale war i don't know what that means tactical nukes are probably one of the possibilities but anyway uh so yeah i agree with you um i also think that unfortunately there's no good solution here and there's only going to be bad choices that are going to have to be made but i do think that at some point negotiation has to happen and i think that at some point compromise is going to have to be reached what that looks like i don't know i don't see how you can make the ukrainians negotiate away more territory from their country when they are successfully counterattacking. 
it just seems illogical to me to to try to force them to the negotiating table at the same time i also recognize that there are, are repercussions to this war that are far larger than ukraine um ultimately i do think that you know some kind of parallel track of negotiations whereby Ukraine and Russia are negotiating and also Russia and the West are negotiating over the sanctions and over other things and that both one is contingent upon the other in some kind of a framework. I mean, that seems like the only possible way of getting out of something like this. Russia has to be, uh, 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 you know, somehow reincorporated to some degree into the global economy or this war just goes on and on and on and unfortunately while i was incorrect about my initial prediction which was i will admit in the uh in in january and february i said it was absolutely impossible possible that the russians would invade ukraine because it just seems so ludicrous to me and such a historic blunder well the russians did it they did commit that historic blunder they have they have walked into this disaster for themselves and it's a disaster really for all of us um you know so anyway i think that ultimately i mean getting back to this issue of nationalisms you know i think that this is also uh one of those one of those aspects where where people are missing the history you know these countries aren't are they're, they're only countries as a result of imperial sort of intrigue the collapse of polish lithuanian empire which then gives rise to russian hegemony and what becomes the pale of settlement for jews uh belarus and ukraine and uh, poland kind of come emerge out of that historical period that then leads us into the great game where the russians and the uh, uh the british were competing over ottoman territories that's how so many of the uh, uh muslims were incorporated into the russian empire that's how russia expanded it to kazakhstan and uh, uh, uh elsewhere as well and again all of these countries they're all major players in this kazakhstan it's interesting have you noticed that nobody even remembers that russia militarily invaded kazakhstan in january of this year to prop up a government that was about to be ousted by a workers uprising the russians literally did that six weeks before invading ukraine so uh you know the peripheries of russia especially in eastern europe and central asia i mean they're really important to understand and, and i think again there's a real lack of understanding in all of that and as you noted a lack of understanding of eastern european nationalism the fact that eastern europe basically missed 1848 and the springtime of the peoples they missed the entire period that came to be known as european nationalism and so yeah i mean in many ways it's like what is it it's like uh you know uh, the nationalist equivalent of trotsky's uh uneven combined development or something you know like totally different p portions of europe living essentially in different time periods yeah and i think that's that and and I don't say that to be patronizing. Like I don't think there's anything backwards about that. I think it's a natural, no. It's historical circumstances, right? It's how it's it played an, out, you know. Um, and and I mean, I think it scrambles the anti-imperialist mind, frankly, because like I don't know how you can all how you can stand for national self-determination and then be like, but not for Ukraine, right? Exactly. Um, and not for a lot of former Soviet satellite states and also not for about a, a bunch of other people, let's be honest. Um, and I think that's going to, I think it's, it, it's totally scrambled the mind because when it is the U S doing bullshit, it is much clearer. And, and like I've told people, even if you believe like, Putin's narrative uh, of grievances. And I think there's a lot of truth in, in, in parts of it. Like, of course. I, I actually do. <laughs> you know, um, there's no question about it. I think denying that would be denying reality. Right. Um, the fact is, he still started the war. Of course. Like, I like, mean, the, it's like, it's like, why, why do we even need to fucking say it? I mean, it's like, it's the most self evident thing that could ever be. And now it's hard to, and you're right, it's hard to imagine what to do, because the one thing I will say is, like, 
one of the ironies of the Russian prior status after Euromaidan with the separatist republics is it actually consolidated Ukrainian identity that was not consolidated exactly. priorly. That's exactly uh, correct. Yep. Um, um, I mean, until that period, you did have people who were largely sympathetic to Russia, kind of spread out in the eastern portions of the country. They're still there. And I also don't know how you reincorporate them. Um, you know, like there's a whole lot of, you know, and, and this is not even dealing with, and, and this is legitimate. Um, the amount of like neoliberal shenanigans and fire sales going on in Ukraine and probably on the Russian side too, to be quite frank, um, uh, this, this area is having civil society devastated. There's very little good that's going to come out of this. Um, but because, if Russia engages in tactical, tactical nuclear wars, it's hard. It's hard for me to not see how that does not escalate. Like it's impossible. It would. It would. It would necessarily escalate. Like, you know, like at that point, NATO gets involved. Has to. Um, um, world war. It's world war. Uh, it, if you're lucky, it's not thermonuclear war. Yeah, like that, that's that's, right. that's that's the best option at that point. And we we do have to try to prevent that from happening. Um, but you also can't ask people to just be like, well, you know, just give it up. Like when when, when they didn't start the fight. Um, well, it's, like, it's, like, so it's like what I'm saying. It's like, how, what are you supposed to ask the person who's who's just had their door kicked in? You're supposed to tell them, okay, come on in. Let's have some let's have some milk and cookies. Let's sit down. Let's talk about. Okay, so which of my things do you want to take? Right. And, and I'm going to say something I think is going to probably blow some people's minds. It's also going to create major para-fascist, post-fascist and fascist movements throughout uh, Eastern Europe. Um, it, it will be like the way Afghanistan was for the Mujahideen. Um, because when you break down civil society, it's usually, frankly, the far right that can benefit from it because it's conservatizing. I mean, if if someone blow if someone blows up your your city and your sister dies, uh, you're gonna side with the most crazy motherfuckers in the room. Like if they're on your side, and also the ones that are doing the things, right? You know what I mean? Like it's this is what I was trying to tell people. It's like you know when 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 these uh, you know cheerleaders for the Kremlin talk about the Azov Battalion and all of this stuff. You know, I'm not gonna get into all of that now. We don't have time, but just to point out that you know. People are, whether in Ukraine or anywhere, they're going to gravitate to whoever's picked up the gun and is defending their town or their neighborhood or their home or whatever. And it has at times been ultra nationalists and fascists in Ukraine and elsewhere that have done that. And unfortunately, one of the things that, and I mean, Putin knew this, and it's part of the <clears throat> it's part of the evil genius of the plan, and it, it, assuming there was a plan, which itself is a matter of debate. But uh, part of the genius of it is that you know the the whole Nazification or denazification is a self fulfilling prophecy, and he knows that, right? That the more that the more that the Russians want to denazify, the more people are going to gravitate to the far right uh, in many different ways. Now, what's interesting about that is the far right has not seemingly gained much ground in Ukraine. And part of the reason is because much has been consolidated into the Ukrainian project. I mean, into the Ukrainian military, into the Ukrainian national forces and so forth. So where there were organized paramilitaries before, to, to a large degree, they've kind of been folded in, you know, and that's kind of interesting now that you have this, by the way, did anybody, did anybody else notice that Russia has pretty much dropped the denazification narrative? They've also dropped the uh, idea of uh, Ukraine's bio labs that are operated by the United States for the purposes of creating uh, uh, chemical and biological weapons that are going to castrate all of uh, Russian children and turn them into transgendered uh, lesbian yeah, Western freaks or whatever they were this saying. This is one thing that I, that people may about Russia's internal propaganda, there's so much weird anti LGBTQ stuff. It's constant. And it's constant. Like, and that's that. I, I think we actually maybe underplay that. Actually, in the West, weirdly, for all that you know, woke imperialism is a thing, um, and it is. Like, we're not denying that at all. Um, uh, there, 
the fact that there is a, an explicitly increasingly reactionary um, uh, social narrative tied to this that is being ignored by certain people is kind of being ignored or in some cases even picked up by like the like leftists picking up some of these talking points as if it's like we should <laughs> start picking up 1936 1937 1941 soviet social policies which were major reversals of prior soviet social policies yeah um as as defense points is it's kind of crazy to me um and what and by the way and they ignore the fact that russia was to a large degree the model that a lot of the uh, far right legislation in the United States has been using. Russia's legal structures about gay propaganda and all of those things, these are the grooming, all of these ideas, these are incorporated and codified in Russian law and they have been for at least the last seven, eight, nine, ten years, right? And a lot of what we see in the United States, particularly in those, uh, you know, more uh, deep red states, is that that legislation, if if not directly, is at least indirectly modeled on what Russia has already done. Yeah, and I, it's it's uh, kind of it worries me to to great to great degree watching left leftist being sucked up into this. Um, it also wor it worries me to great degree that we are having so a very hard time. Uh, what I think th this will be the last point you, you push back on me and saying that, you know, you thought a lot of the people I was talking about were liberals. And what I would say is like, there's a whole swath of the American left that is like Schrodinger's leftist liberal. Um, like, like depending on how you frame something to them, they can go either way. I, I think like 70% of the DSA, for example, is probably in this camp. Um, and, um, I worry about the recuperation towards American militarism, but I also worry about the left discrediting itself by being clear uh, pushers of somebody else's propaganda that, that you really have to be in a fairly enclosed worldview or outside of Europe and the United States and kind of removed from the situation to believe. I mean, these are the same people who were telling me that all the stuff about, you know, and I got, I got right-wing friends who would, yes, Virginia, so have right-wing friends. I have right-wing friends who are pushing back to me and left-wing friends who are pushing back on me. You're like, well, don't you think Russia is really winning? And don't you think all this is like Western imperial propaganda and it's all bullshit and these guys are idiots? And I'm like, I don't know, but it does feel like it actually doesn't look like it. Like, it does look like, like somehow Russia is doing a really bad job. Like, and, and when I, when I was sold on that was the, the, to, the mobile, the, the public total mobilization. I'm like, they're conscripting people who aren't trained and they don't have time to train them. That's a sign that they're getting their ass kicked. Uh, like, three days ago, three days ago, they uh, changed certain laws. They relaxed certain laws. They are now allowing for conscription of dual citizens not just Russian citizens, but if you happen to be one of these poor bastards who has dual citizenship and lives in Russia, you are now getting conscripted. They have also changed the law to allow to make it easier for um, um, uh, residents, citizens of co uh, CIS countries. That is the Commonwealth of Independent States, which is the organization that is the for of the former Soviet Union. So Russia plus the former Soviet republics. If you are a citizen of one of those former Soviet republics and you uh, volunteer to go fight in Ukraine, they're now opening a pathway to citizenship for you. And they also recently changed the law to allow for foreign non-CIS citizens to volunteer to make it easier. And specifically, there's talk of Syrians Afghans, Iranians, and uh, uh, North Koreans, a handful of others that the Russians are potentially looking at bringing into Ukraine. And these are just three of the legal changes that were made like in the last week. So, I mean, you talk about desperation for, for, for warm bodies. I mean, the Russians are desperate for bodies. Right. And, and they're losing to a country that's been totally devastated. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that I think that even the West over 
like we we've seen in West reports like, oh, if the land war in Europe, uh, we might lose to Russia. And I, I want to point that out. The U.S. military has a reason to push those narratives. Of course, because it increases their ability of to get fucking <laughs> like. Um, but I think a lot of people thought that the like in Afghanistan and Iraq, they thought, oh, it's just American incompetence. And I'm like, no, that's for like fourth generation warfare actually indicates this will happen to any major power that tries to do this. Like, like unless unless you are willing to wage a war of imminent extermination and very few nations in the world are going to let you do that. Um, this is what you get, get stuck with. Right. Um so unless you're willing to, quote, Grozny the entirety of Ukraine and also deny most of the world its food, um, you're going to have a problem. Like, and I think one of the things I will say is I think we're going to see a lot of complications of, uh, of stances towards Russia and Africa because of the food shortages. Um and I don't think NATO will be blamed for all of that. Um, NATO does play a role in it. Uh, all the major powers do, actually. But, but like, e Egypt and Egypt processes most of the grain for North Africa. Um, Egypt used to grow its own, but in the last ten years, it's been getting it mostly from Ukraine. It's running out. Like. It, it's going to get bad. Um, yeah. I mean, the Black Sea, Cra the, the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which was the deal that was, uh, you know, ultimately brokered by Turkey, uh, whereby Russia and Turkey and the United Nations jointly inspect uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, grain shipments and then eventually let them out. It's created a tremendous bottleneck. So even though Ukraine is exporting a I don't not 100 percent of their normal capacity, but it's something like a, 60, a, 70 percent. Yeah, I mean a pretty big chunk of what they normally are producing. They're still producing and exporting, but it's not actually getting there is the problem for a for a host of reasons. And yeah, I mean, I did a, I did several videos on the issue of you know going back to the very beginning of this war because it was very obvious that once once you know we came time to you know to the harvest and to the colder months that this was going to be a very real problem. And I know that Egypt has shifted. They were scrambling to find other countries to import from. I know that they did to some degree. Um, but it, it, it's not something that can just easily be replaced. Um, and this is another aspect of this. And this is, again, where so many of these, quote unquote, you know, self-professed anti-imperialists just totally drop the ball in understanding the way in which this war and the continuation of this war, well, the, the initiation of it and the continuation of it is fanning the flames of other wars. Right. So the the I think that we absolutely could very very realistically see a full-blown war in the Horn of Africa at some yep. point in the next year to two years. And that's Azerbaijan and Armenia. Are gonna Azerbaijan, go ahead and eventually Azerbaijan and Armenia. Once again, they already had war in 2020 that Azerbaijan definitively and, and, and quite handily uh, destroyed the Armenian military and primarily because of Turkey. Turkey is the primary backer of Azerbaijan. Turkey is a major player now in Africa. Turkey was the dominant player in Libya that essentially beat back the Russians who were backing the uh, Haftar, uh, the so-called Libyan National Army there. Um, so Turkey has uh, uh, sort of shown itself to be a major player now. And there's a reason why, I mean, Erdogan swooped into Ukraine to sign a deal with Zelensky for a drone factory three weeks before the Russians invaded. So it's like, you know, Erdogan has been playing uh, uh, very, uh, you know, clever games here. And in fact, that would uh, remind me that uh, another aspect of the history that people really should understand is how the Ottoman period played out and why a Russia Turkey rivalry is very, very interesting to pay attention to in Central Asia. Uh, in Central Asia, in a place like Kazakhstan, for example, Russia, as I already mentioned, militarily invaded in order to prop up the Nazarbayev government, which was about to be ousted by a workers' uprising there. Kazakhstan, the people of Kazakhstan, they hate the Chinese, who are the major investors there, and they hate the Russians. And what they don't hate is Turkey. 
Isn't that interesting? Because the Kazakhs didn't, Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakh people didn't have a proper written language. They didn't look to the Russians. They looked to replace Russian with their own language, which they based off of Turkey and Turkish, right? The Turkic peoples. This is what neo-Ottomanism is all about. Erdogan sees Turkey's uh, uh, rightful place as essentially being the hegemon all the way to the Uyghurs of Sinjak, who are also Turkic peoples, right? So if if you look at the history region, you have essentially the Russians and the Chinese and the Turkish involved over centuries in not just uh, fighting over these territories, but quite literally colonizing, right? So again, there's like many layers of uh, um, issues that I think need to be parsed in, in trying to understand this. And again, the, the, the grain issue alone is a major one because it's not just African countries, Lebanon is is all, been teetering on the brink of collapse for about five years, and a major shortage of grain in Lebanon could absolutely send them over the edge. I mean, there's a host of countries that are in this position as well. Yeah, I think this is this is an important point to kind of turn back on as the United States, and you know, I hate it because it's it's actually right centrists like peter zion who have been better at predicting this than most of the left unfortunately but we've seen these pre um pre 20th century models emerge back up and people have been blindsided by them while people like erdogan or putin or uh, a modi have been pushing them i mean this is why like bricks you know, to, to, uh, Br Brics is never going to happen because India and China are not going to get along. Like they will agree to to tacitly, softly back Russia as long as it actually doesn't really demand that much. But they don't play well together. And in fact, one of the things that we are seeing is Modi really building up his his navy in 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 this to curtail and slow the growth of the Chinese. Like. And of course, the United States is just gonna let that happen. Yeah, hey man, you just gotta, you, you just gotta, you just gotta look at the last fifteen years of history in Sri Lanka to understand what India and China are really all about here. I mean, Sri Lanka got deeply in bed with the Chinese, and uh, in case people didn't pay attention, the government has collapsed. It is now a, 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 a essentially a, a debt disaster, a country that uh, the economy is completely uh, broken. The, 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 the government had to flee, essentially. Um, and uh, Sri Lanka has a major uh, uh, port that the Chinese control. There is, uh, you know, this is part of the so-called string of pearls strategy that the Chinese were supposedly incorporating to the included the Seychelles islands that included Sri Lanka that included, you know, their ability to get around the Straits of Malacca and so forth. Right. So like the Chinese. Uh, anyway, yeah, I mean. <laughs> There's so yeah. many, there's so many aspects to all of that. The bottom line is, yeah, India and China aren't going to play well together. And frankly, um, if you look at the scale of trade between India and uh, uh, Russia versus India and the United States, I mean, they're not even in the same galaxy. You know, the, the India US trade is like a hundred times the size of India-Russia trade. Russia offers almost nothing to India with the exception of two critical uh, uh, areas. One is nuclear technology and the other is military technology. Right. Those two are the primary things that Russia has. They're two obviously major, uh, you know, uh, trump cards that the, uh, that the Russians hold with a lot of countries. So, you know, whatever that means. Yeah, I think I think that well, that's the interesting thing is you. But as I pointed out to people, both China and India, for all this talk of, of BRICS and all this, I'm like, they're integrated into the U.S. economic trade system, into the blue order trade system, totally. I mean, if, if they lose access to the West, if they completely lose access to the U.S. markets, for example, they are fucked. Like, well, it would collapse Modi's government, and he knows that. Right. So it would it also would... collapse Xi's government. So yeah. it's like. It, it it's like so there's a real hard limit on how much they can they can do now has other players like yeah i mean who knows the saudis have been playing everyone in this uh yeah no I question mean, like, like you know um 
I was pointing out this like people who were getting mad about Yemen, and I was like, well, I don't know what you think is going to happen when the Chinese start buying Saudi oil. You think they're going to tell them not to beat up on Yemen? Like, yeah. like who do you think's a good guy here? The Chinese were just in Saudi Arabia exploring a multi a, a hundred billion dollar weapons deal. I mean, were you kidding me? Right. I mean, it's just the people don't know enough to have an informed opinion. Um, yeah. And the left, I mean, like I said, and this is going to be my final point. I was really upset with the left during the during the Bernie to Bernie years because they weren't paying attention to international politics anymore. But now that they are, I'm kind of like it was better when you didn't. Yeah. Like, yes. like, 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 I, I, um, it's just like that's a good one. Uh, it, it's one of these things where I'm like, knowing a little bit is sometimes worse than knowing nothing. Like, yes. um, it was better when you didn't have a position. Yeah, it was better when you were just like not messing around with stuff you yeah. don't understand. Yeah. Um, and and you know, I think as 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 people who who work and publish in a left wing milieu, who are you know, uh. I don't consider myself a reformist. I'm not a necess- I'm not an. I'm not one of these people who thinks that we shouldn't attempt reforms in the capitalist system. But I know it'll never be sufficient. Um, but all that said, like there is a way in which a lot of people, now that this reformism has left, have kind of just been fantasizing about are are grifting, frankly on international politics while doing nothing about it. Like, yeah, yes. we should be pushing for better shit out of Congress, but you're going to have to talk about what you need to do to build relationships, to enforce that because we haven't done that. We have nothing to scare them into being more responsible. And in the case of some of this stuff, we also don't have coherent positions. You like, know, one of the, one of the real tragedies of this period that we're living through on the left specifically is the fact that I think the left has really to a large degree abandoned its historic role. And what I mean is that historically in the West, the left has not really had power. Right. I mean, I suppose you could say in some European contexts, yes, maybe, but sort of, broad- kinda. yeah, sort of. But broadly speaking, the left doesn't exercise political power uh, in the West. What the left does do very well, in fact, historically, while it doesn't have power, it has analysis. The left is supposed to be able to provide an incisive analysis of what's happening uh, internationally, locally, but also internationally, that other uh, viewpoints, that other perspectives will not be able to provide. And obviously, the period of the Cold War is a pri- is a primary example of that. The left had an, an- the, the, you know, the, the Marxist left, I guess, had an analysis of Vietnam that was stridently different from uh, what you would get from the mainstream milieu or from a liberal milieu or what have you, right? If you read the books of that time or you read the, you know, the literature of that time, that's very clear. The left historically has this responsibility of being able to, whether it's in the form of polemics, whether it's in the form of debate, whether it's in the form of uh, active party uh, uh, movements or what have you, the left has uh, an analysis, one that is rigorous, one that is materially sound, one that is rooted in facts. And this is where the left, I think, has really failed its historic obligation and historic duty is that I don't think the left has that analysis anymore. I think the left is fractured into in much the same way that all of our society kind of has fractured into this, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Geopolitics as consumerism. Yeah, geopolitics as con- yeah, like, uh, yeah, but also just a kind of uh, fragmented, fandoms. yeah, just like a fragmented understanding of how to cobble together a worldview. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not enough to just have a label. You have to actually have an analysis that goes with that. Otherwise, yeah. your label doesn't mean anything. Well, yeah, I mean, this is where people like we. I would have people on Twitter get mad at me when I would talk about don't mention revolutionary defeatism in regards to Ukraine because it literally uh, has nothing to do, of course, with with you know revolutionary defeatism. Actually, and the only reason it worked, to be quite honest, is somehow both Russia and Germany lost. Like, 
like you know um the the these specific conditions for that are not transferable to any time you see any warfare and um, i would also i would also urge people to recall that uh, 1917 happened in the middle of world fucking war like the conditions that world war creates create unique political circumstances, you know, where we're not in that situation right now. The idea that I, I don't even know what revolutionary defeatism, defeatism is supposed to mean. Does anybody believe that a uh, uh, Russian uh, victory in Ukraine would somehow lead to the end of the United States, a collapse of the U S government, a destabilization of the U S state, some uh, uh, a demilitarization? No, of course not. It, it would wouldn't only even lead, lead to, to the breakup of NATO. <laughs> like it it wouldn't, it wouldn't it would it would only lead to a massive increase in funding for US military and US adventurism in US weapons flowing all over the world it's an on and on and on i mean it's obvious what would happen right but like you know they have to kind of continue to play out this sort of fantasy that they're all you know little little uh, you know little uh, cosplaying lenins or something you know when the reality is they're just they're, they're just grifting they're just trying to make right. some money yeah, I mean, I think that's that that's the the thing that sort of uh, become very obvious to me. And uh, yes. there's there are, there are material there are material implications in U.S. society that was this the, the destruction of of uh, of journalism has been a big one. Honestly, uh, I mean, I loved it when people were paying Glenn Greenwald to actually do international reporting as opposed to just making stupid commentary about about. <laughs> Uh, whatever stupid fight they're having on Twitter this week, or maybe uh, trying to recuperate Alex Jones as a victim figure or something. I mean, like, you know, I miss those days when those people actually were doing something interesting. And, you know, yes, some of that is moral character, but a lot of it, if we're completely honest, is the way the media has completely declined. And this is another reason why people can't make good decisions anymore are like know what the fuck is going on because let's be frank most even the new york times frankly is getting half its information from fucking twitter um which is why people freaked out about the the decline of twitter is because it's like it's not actually a major social but this is a whole different thing it's not actually a major social media platform comparatively depending on which list is either the 16th or 20th largest um it's because it's what media figures use um yep. and well because the thing is that ultimately like i mean you know the dirty secret is that like they don't want to do work yeah they don't want to do work they don't want to pay and they, they don't want to pay for that work let's like let's be honest like there are reporters who'd love to actually do it but they're not going to do it for no money and you know you and i, I may do it because we're ideologically motivated but but that's not going to be the average reporter. No, um, of course not. I mean, part of the what you said at the very beginning of our conversation, which I thought was funny, and I kind of chuckled to myself about the, you know, about this label, independent political analyst. You know, I mean, like, you want to know what it means to be an independent political analyst? It means having a nine to five fucking job. You right. know what I mean? It means like having a job that allows you to actually be independent, right? If you're sitting at home and like this is all you do, then chances are you're not really independent, are you? Now, it may very well be that you're just like one of these content creators or whatever, but I see it. I was just it was literally I'm not going to I'm not going to go into any details about it, but I was just speaking with a friend of mine about several relatively prominent uh voices on the left uh that are conspicuously silent about ukraine not because they support russia if they supported russia they wouldn't be silent but they are silent why because they unfortunately have a base of subscribers to whom they have to reinforce whatever their preconceived notions are and a lot of people are very nervous about losing 
their subscribers if they are seen to be taking the wrong position on one side or the other. And uh, it's pathetic, frankly. I'm I'm embarrassed by this. I'm embarrassed the fact that this is the state of uh, the left, that this is the state of journalism. This is something that, I mean, it's the reason why I got into, well, we used to call alternative media, although I don't know that that means anything anymore because there's millionaires in it. Yeah. So I don't know what I mean. Back when, back, back when I got into it, you were lucky if you could find anybody to pay you a dollar for anything. You so know, I, I, mean? I did leftist podcasting for seven fucking years at my cost. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. I started my first podcast in 2011. I don't think I've ever gotten out of the hole. <laughs> I don't think I ever did. Um, but in any event, I just, uh, unfortunately, yeah. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's the way that the media has gone. It's the way that social media has transformed media. And really, ultimately, I, I would point to one thing specifically. It was it was the moment at which this sort of, that social media was able to monetize all of this. Yeah, once it, it yeah, yeah, once it really monetized, that's when it really turned to shit. That, I mean, that was the death of the blog. Because yep. they couldn't yep. pay to to share stuff on Facebook. The reason why the media people use Twitter, like, like, it's partly because they don't want to work, and it's partly because it's not nearly as paywall cartel. Like you don't have to like. But I mean that it, it, if you're an intermediate media organization and you and I have both worked for them, you still do. I have in the past. You have to pay to get stuff seen on that algorithm. Yep. Like I used to run a literary magazine, pure literary magazine, right, just off of a WordPress. The day they started monetizing uh, ads for for pushing out stuff on pages, I saw my viewership drop in half. Yep. Um, I continued to fight the good fight for th for until two thousand, and then I just gave up. Like, um, and. And uh, as a podcaster, I will admit, yeah, yeah, it's easier for me to get clicks through 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 Twitter, even though it's a much smaller base, but I, I still can say what I want exactly for the reason why you're saying I have a day job. Um, and if I was a podcaster who totally lived off podcasting, I wouldn't do politics. I do something like history or something. Yep. I wouldn't, I could live with myself. <laughs> like, yep. Yep. like, like, uh, because I would, because you do, you have to confirm people's biases a lot of the time. Uh, I, and I lose a lot of subscribers every, every month. For yes. And, off. and, and don't get me wrong. I totally appreciate the pressures that people have. People have families, people have mortgages, people have, you know what I mean? Like I, I have all of those same considerations. The difference is that I'm not the, doing this work for me. This is the extent of the political work that I really do these days. I'm 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 not uh, a frontline activist like I once was. I, I'm not frequenting rallies like I used to and things like that. This is basically the politics that I do to a large degree now, and uh, that's how I sort of think of it. And I don't see this as my. Uh, occupation. I don't see this as something that's supposed to generate a tremendous amount of revenue for me or anything like that. And so, yeah, I feel like I can say what I actually think as opposed to saying what I think my subscribers want to hear. Yeah. I, I, I take enough money to justify the time I put into it and that's about it. And, um, and I, 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 I do not envy people who have to live off stuff. I've known them. I've worked with them. I'm friends with a lot. I mean, I'm friends with a lot of the more famous podcasters because I've been doing this for so long. And uh, one of the things I'll say about that world is the top tier of millionaires, but the next tier down, they're like lucky to make thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year doing this. And then people like me are like, yeah, I'll make a, a grand or so after cost. Um, and Honestly, that's pretty good man that, no I, I consider myself in the mid tier of, of podcasting right like yeah. even, um but if you were to ask me could i live off this fuck no no that's no. insane and 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 if i did i'd have to do things that i don't want to do well and also it's it's just an endless hustle and that's the dumbest that's the dumbest part of it is like do i don't want to live on 12 different social media platforms and have to you know what i mean have to keep pushing my stuff all day every day like that like i just want the work to be out there i hope that it's educating people i hope that it's helping to bring uh perspectives that people need that are lacking and and if i 
I mean, really, ultimately, my, my, my true hope is that it's affecting some kind of change in the real world, although that may be something of a pipe dream. I don't know. Yeah, uh, this will be my last statement, too. My, my goal is to educate people because I don't see a lot of change happening in the real world anytime right. real soon. Yeah. But I do see people interested enough that maybe someone who's younger than me and as smart or smarter than me can pick this up and run with it. Um, because I do actually have like, yeah, I mean, I think Zoomers are socially alienated weirdos, but they're also like our only hope. So uh, even us millennials are I'm a Gen X millennial borderline person myself. I think you and I are about the same age, actually. 1983. Um, 1980. So. So, uh, yeah, we're in that weird 78 to 83. No yeah. one really knows what the fuck we are. Um, yeah, we, we remember a world pre-internet, but we also know how to be on the internet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I also vaguely remember the Cold War, but only the end of it, um, which that three years actually matters for. But um, all that is to say, however, that um, I think it's important for people not to get sucked into the media narratives, whether they be mainstream or alternative, because none of them right now, you know, you learn good things. Like, you know, there, there are some shows that we've been tacitly critiquing right now that I actually think I have learned things from, um, but you have to approach it critically. You have to approach us critically. Fuck. Like, like, like neither one of us are specialists. Like I, I am, my opinion on Syria comes from talking to people and reading about it. It's, it's not like I was there getting shot at. Um, uh, but talking to people in adjacent countries, I will say that, which is more than a lot of journalists fucking do. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, on that note, we're going to end this stream so we can talk a little bit about literature um, and film. And so Great. for the, for those of you who are not in the studio with us, which is the studio is virtual, so no one is, um, you will see this probably two weeks after this comes out. Um, but for us, this is the same day. All right. And so we're going to end here and I will see you.